Greetings to everyone that comes here this day. I'm Jeff Radley, the pastor at First United Methodist Church in Hartford, Wisconsin. It is my hope and prayer that you are staying safe in your home this day as you come to this worship experience. Today is the second Sunday in Easter. Easter for Christians is not just one day, but a 50-day period. The season of Easter, called Eastertide, begins at sunset on the eve of Easter and ends on Pentecost, the day that we celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the church. And you can see more about that in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. This year, Pentecost Sunday, is May 31st. Easter is also more than just an extended celebration of the resurrection of Jesus. In the early church, Lent was a season for those that were new to Christianity to learn about the faith and prepare for baptism on Easter Sunday. The initial purpose of the 50-day Easter season was to continue the faith formation of the new Christians. Today, this 50-day period gives us time to rejoice and experience what it means when we say Christ is risen. It's the season when we should be remembering our baptisms and how through baptism we are incorporated into Christ's mighty acts of salvation. As Easter people, we also celebrate and ponder the birth of the church and gifts of the Spirit and how we should live as faithful disciples of Christ. Let us be in an attitude of prayer this day. Surprising God, we come to Easter through the long Latin journey in which you have called us to examine our inner lives. We've certainly had time to examine ourselves as we've been sheltering in place to avoid the ravages of the ongoing pandemic. But Easter came, and it's though we've been freed from our darkness to walk in the light with you. However, Easter and its celebrations so quickly slide into the past and we again are tempted to move back into our doubts and fears. Surprise us again, Lord, as Jesus surprised his disciple Thomas, who feared and doubted. Remind us that the signs of Jesus' resurrection are all around us. As we remember this day, let us remember our dear friends who suffer from illness and loss. Lord, help us to be a comfort for them. For those who are lost and alone, alienated from family and friends, we ask that you empower us to reach out in compassion, offering appropriate help that will lift them into new life with you. We pray for all anywhere who are in situations of danger, war, and strife. We pray that your peace will be with them and that the warfare and all dangers, including the coronavirus will be vanquished by your good news. For our community, our nation, Lord, we ask that you give the leaders compassion and wisdom, remembering that their lives rest in your care. And for ourselves, we ask for the extra measure of faith so that no doubts arise. We may meet them with confidence and emerge as strong witnesses to your love. In Christ's name we offer this prayer. Amen. I have titled my message this day, Doubt Deepens Faith. I begin by telling of a young man that was surviving by picking pockets. One day he lifted something he thought was full of money, only to later discover that it was a copy of the New Testament. Angry, he threw the Bible to the floor. Yet later that night, Unable to sleep, he remembered the little book. He started to read the New Testament, and it gradually changed his life. He soon abandoned his bad habits and surrendered his heart to Christ. From that day forward, he looked for opportunities to tell the disciple stories about the risen Christ. Do you take opportunities to tell your disciple stories? Maybe ours aren't as colorful as this young man, but 
we need to be telling our disciple stories. The disciple stories after the crucifixion began as one of fear. Ten of the disciples were meeting to pray. Judas was already dead and Thomas was absent from the first Jesus sighting. Thomas, who is also called Didymus, is the disciple whose name has become a household word. Doubting Thomas must have been from Missouri. He's the guy that said, show me. His words were, unless I see the nail prints in his hands and put my finger in the nail prints and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. Thomas may have also been the most mysterious of the 12. Some legends say that Thomas was a twin of Lydia of Philippi. Some traditions say the 12 divided up the world for evangelism and Thomas got India. Tradition also has it that Thomas was killed by a spear thrust while he prayed and that a church was built on that spot. What do we really know about Thomas? Aside from the list of disciples in the New Testament, he appears in three passages of Scripture, all in the Gospel of John. In John 11, 14 through 16, at the death of Lazarus, Thomas is willing to go with Jesus back to Judea, even if it means going to die with Jesus. To me, that doesn't sound much like doubt. In John 14, 1 through 5, Thomas asks a question about the way to heaven. And it sounds more like confused ignorance of what Jesus is really saying than genuine doubt. And finally, in John 20, verses 24 through 29, we read that when Thomas is told of the Easter evening appearance to the disciples at which he was not present, he responded by saying he would not believe Jesus had risen from the dead unless he could see physically the wounds. Well, let's listen now to our lesson from John for this day. It's chapter 20, verses 19 through 31, and this is from the Modern English Version. On that evening of the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were then glad they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As my Father has sent me, even so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven them. If you re retain the sins of anyone, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told them, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail prints in his hands, and put my finger in the nail prints, and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. After eight days, his disciples were again inside with the door shut, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came and stood among them, and he said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand here and place it in my side. Do not be faithless, but believing. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be. God.
If Jesus was limited to one physical body, there would be a line so long that people would not stand and wait to talk to Jesus. Fortunately, God had a wiser plan. Jesus fills us with the Holy Spirit. That means we can talk about him anywhere, anytime. Jesus can always be found in the pages of the Bible, in places of prayer, times of worship, or anywhere we may be. He's as real today as he was to Thomas. Perhaps you had a difficult time this week. You might not have had enough money to pay a bill. You might not be sure your car is going to get you home. You might have a health problem. You may be suffering from cabin fever or loneliness because we're all sheltering place in this time of the pandemic. You might have bigger problems than that. Yet all these circumstances, all these situations, all of these barriers, all of these conditions tell us to be afraid. They rob us of our courage. They take away our joy. Like Thomas, some people doubt before they can believe. We need to let our doubts lead us to prayer, and we need to let our prayer lead us to Jesus. Let's allow our doubts to deepen our faith as we continue to look for the risen Jesus. Have you seen the risen Lord? Are you telling your disciple stories to others? It's human nature to have certainty in some areas of life and doubt in others. Those who pass through the valley of doubt emerge with stronger faith than those who never face their doubts. But the problem of Thomas isn't doubt. We've assigned that label to him for being late the church once, basically. Thomas wasn't there, so we speculate on why he was absent. Was it overwhelming grief? A meeting with a faith group? It seems the demand of Thomas to touch the wounds of Jesus was more of a regret that he was absent from that first meeting with the risen Jesus. We're all aware that when proof was offered, when Jesus offered to actually let Thomas touch the wounds, Thomas didn't take him up on it. The problem wasn't doubt. We shouldn't have labeled Thomas that way. We should have labeled him maybe as Thomas the loyalist or Thomas the committed in light of his willingness to go and die with Jesus. Thomas had a problem shared by many others. He may have been melancholy and discouraged. He sometimes sounded like somebody who has been reading Ecclesiastes too much, the book where the narrator laments that everything in life is endless and meaningless, especially human toil and the cycles of nature, for nothing is ever truly new on earth. The emotions of Thomas were bigger than the rest of them. He illustrates a gloomy temperament, his hesitation to embrace new and distant shores. In short, just reluctant to embrace the change around them. Do you find yourself there? The cure for a gloomy spirit is the commitment of fellowship. Eight days after his absence, Thomas is back, surrounded by others and in the presence of the Lord. And yes, I say fellowship. Even in this time of social separation, that's because we think of fellowship as being together, but fellowship is actually defined as friendly association, especially with people who share one's interests. There are certainly ways in the age of electronic communication that we're able to still fellowship together. We are, after all, gathered around the First United Methodist YouTube channel, even though we're physically separated. Have you ever noticed that some people possess extra charisma, charm, and allure? Their presence makes a room come alive. There is a magnetic pull toward them as they begin to talk and walk around. 
They have that special something that causes people to stop and listen. They have that special something that speaks to the very heart of people's lives. When they walk into the room, the whole atmosphere of the room changes. People rush to them and are quiet to hear them speak. Presidents John Kennedy and Ronald Reagan both had magnetic personalities. When they'd start to talk, people stopped what they were doing to absorb their every word. But as charismatic and as charming and as electrifying as they may have been, no one had more power to change the atmosphere of a room than Jesus. Jesus was able to command the attention of thousands of men and women and children for hours or days at a time. He possessed mega charisma. Our lesson today deals with one of these electric moments in the life of Jesus and his followers. It was one of those times when Jesus' mere presence in a room transformed absolutely everything. With Jesus present in the room, things went from negative to positive instantly. With Jesus present, courage and faith appeared where there was once fear and doubt. With Jesus in the room, there was laughter and joy where there had once been sorrow and despair. What Jesus did in that room so long ago, he wants to do in our lives today. When we invite Jesus to be present among us, we experience joy, peace, transformation, salvation, courage, and faith in amazing ways. Ways that will change not only the atmosphere of our setting today, but ways that will change all of us as well. So what exactly in this passage do we see Jesus doing? What can his presence do to a room full of people, especially people that need courage and direction and faith? The disciples gathered together had every right to be terrified. The Romans had just crucified their rabbi, their teacher, and their leader. As far as they knew, they'd be the next ones overlooking the city on Golgotha's hillside. And instead, of there being only three crosses, there might be 11 or more. I'm sure you can sense the anxiety and the fear that was present in that room. With Jesus dead, it wouldn't take long for the Sadducees and the Pharisees to gather up his remaining followers. In no time, the teachings and influence of Jesus would just simply fade away like leaves falling from a tree. Sure, there'd be some who'd try to hold on, to still be obedient to his teachings, but with enough pressure, they would buckle and grow silent. Jesus had been found guilty of both treason and blasphemy. By following him, they'd be labeled the same way. How long could they hide out in Jerusalem before it was safe to go back to Galilee? Would it ever be safe to go back to Galilee? What would they do now? They'd given up everything to follow Jesus. What would they do if someone found where they were hiding? No doubt they were afraid, not just for their lives, but their families' lives as well. When Jesus told them to pick up their cross and follow him, they never thought he really meant that a real cross could be their fate. Now they huddled together, afraid, and behind closed doors that looked very much like their doom. But then, in God's good glory, it happened. Suddenly, in the middle of their anxiety and their angst, Jesus appears. Not even a locked door could keep him out, nor a room filled with fear, doubt, and despair. Jesus had, a, had arrived and was bringing peace and harmony. For that's what Jesus does with our fear, with our anxieties, and with our despair. When Jesus comes into our midst, that all begins to vanish. 
Instead of fear comes courage. Instead of anxiety, there comes peace and tranquility. Instead of despair, it's replaced with joy and laughter and celebration. To experience joy is wonderful. Yet far too many people, for them it's evasive. These disciples learn that true joy is relational in nature. The true lasting joy happens between people. The society in which we live promotes that true joy can be found in the possession of things. All we can do is watch a car or a phone commercial. The idea is that if we own some particular item, we will suddenly be overwhelmed with great lasting joy and happiness. And yet history is full of stories that prove otherwise. Joy lasts about as long as the shine on our new toy. In a matter of days, we're overwhelmed again with loneliness and despair, often because the shine wears off and the payments go on and on. This day, the presence of Jesus makes all the difference. In place of doubt, fear, and despair, we find Jesus will bring peace and courage and faith. In the place of sorrow, Jesus will bring great joy. In the place of loneliness, Jesus will breathe upon us the Holy Spirit to lead, guide, and transform us from the inside out. In the place of transgressions, Jesus will bring healing and forgiveness. Jesus offers us mercy and grace and freedom. Jesus invites us to a life of adventure. Are you at peace? and experiencing true joy? Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Are you sharing your disciple stories? Amen. As I leave you this day, please remember our church building remains closed at this time. Please also remember the life of the church goes on. It is so important that you continue to send your tithes and your offerings during this time of the COVID-19 pandemic. I want to thank all of you for your continuing support during this difficult time. So please stay safe. Always err on the side of caution. And God bless you all.